Order, order. Uh, there, there is a matter before the chair, Senator Birmingham. Are you seeking the call on that I, matter? I, 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 I am on that matter. Uh, the matter Mr. that President. is before the chair, I um, will be clear. The, uh, that's right. So, Mr. President, I seek leave to uh, to withdraw uh, the motion I moved in relation to hours of meeting for today, uh, and therefore to avoid the need to call a division. Uh, in doing so, I indicate to the chamber I will bring at the end of question time a revised motion to the chamber. The revised motion includes Senator McKim's request for the consideration of a disallowance motion as part of the revised hours of business. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. I also seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. You have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Colbeck and Senator Seselja will be absent from question time today, Wednesday, 30 March 2022, for personal reasons. In Senator Colbeck's absence, Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, the Minister for Sport, the Minister for Health and Aged Care, and the Minister for Regional Health. In Senator Seselja's absence, Senator Payne will represent the Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction and the Minister for Science and Technology. I thank the Senate. Thank you. Now, I, I will just note we will move to question time now. I will note we are starting a, a, a minute and a half late. And I also will note that I uh, said yesterday that I would come back to the Senate in relation to points of order taken by Senators Wish Wilson and McKim in relation to matters raised in question time. I, I reiterate the point I made at the time that I considered the minister's answer to be directly relevant to the questions asked. I do not see it as my role as president to interpret a question as narrowly as the questioner might wish. In circumstances uh, in which the minister, and particularly a minister in a representative capacity, uh, is, take, is talking directly about the government's intentions or actions in respect to the matter raised. This falls squarely within the principle that presidents cannot direct a minister how to answer questions. In answering the primary question, the minister discussed the government's provisioning, provision of additional funding to enhance the management of the Great Barrier Reef in the face of several issues, including the specific matter raised. By speaking further about the scope and aims of the funding, the minister remained relevant to the question asked, even though senators may have preferred that the minister have provided a different response. On the ruling, sir. Certainly, <laughs> Senator Long. Uh, uh, I don't wish to delay the chamber. There are another number of issues in that with which the opposition, uh, in relation to which the opposition might seek to put a submission to you. Uh, and in particular, I note uh, the reference to representative ministers. Um, the clerk has previously indicated, or I think Senator Ryan had previously indicated, you know, it's, if a, representative, a, re a minister representing is asked about the state of mind of another minister, then obviously that's not in their knowledge. But I would respectfully suggest that it would be a new um, threshold to suggest that somehow rep ministers representing have a different level of accountability to the chamber to ministers um, in their own portfolio. I don't wish to delay the chamber. I wish to reserve our position in relation to what you have articulated. To we, we have we do want to consider whether or not what you have just said, Mr. President, um, is consistent with rulings of past presidents. Uh, and I would ask. I note that you said we started one and a half minutes late. I would ask that question time continue until the first uh, from the moment the first question is asked not the argy-bargy, if I may, beforehand. Thank you. Senator McKim, on the matter. Just in response to your ruling, very briefly, President, if I could just indicate we share the concerns expressed by Senator Wong and um, just uh, place on the record that we may seek to make a further submission to you in regards to that ruling. I would welcome further submissions, uh, but on that we will move to question time and I saw call Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that real wages are predicted to go backwards by 1.5 per cent this year, even more than the Morrison government's last budget anticipated? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Ayres uh, for his question. Uh, Mr President, the budget papers do set out uh, the impacts of what we are seeing are global shocks and disruptions in relation to 
pressures on inflation uh, in Australia and right around the world. Uh, the shocks, the aftershocks of COVID-19 uh, that are causing disruptions to global supply chains, but most notably the terrible, tragic war that Russia is inflicting upon Ukraine at present, have had enormous implications for inflationary pressures right around the world. Those opposite may not want to acknowledge the fact that oil price spikes are a real inflationary factor, but they are a real inflationary factor. Senator Ayres spoke about uh, the change in relation uh, to inflation figures since the previous budget. Well, of course, since the previous budget, we have seen huge spikes in oil prices, which have a very direct impact in relation to there being higher inflation. Our government's responding to these pressures that Australians face. We're responding in terms of providing a 22 cent a litre reduction in the fuel excise, lowering petrol prices for Australians while this spike is in place, while the world moves through these terrible difficulties caused by what's happening in Ukraine, providing additional support to low, middle, fixed income Australians. And why are we able to do that, Mr President? We're able to do it because our government's created a strong economy, a strong economy that's got more Australians in jobs, a strong economy that's provided a stronger budget position that's enabling us to have lower deficits, lower debt, but also provide additional support for Australians when they need it. Additional support for Australian households, additional support for Australian motorists, farmers and businesses Minister, to ensure they get Minister, the help they deserve. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Order. I, I take it that's a yes. Uh, can, can the minister confirm an average Australian worker will be $1,355 worse off this financial year thanks to real wages going backwards under this government again? Order. Minister. Mr President, I addressed the impact of inflation before, and it's set out in the budget papers in relation to uh, that interaction between inflation and wage rises. Now, the wage price index is forecast to uh, grow to three and a quarter per cent in the new financial year starting 1 July, following the provision of uh, these additional supports that we're providing. It then grows further to three and a half per cent, real wages growth put out into the future. The Senator Ayres, though, Mr President, also asks about the dollar value. The dollar value. For, uh, for Australians in different circumstances. Well, when it comes to take-home pay for Australians, Mr. President, there are many factors at play. And when it comes to take-home play, our income tax cuts play a very big factor, Mr. President. They play a very big factor. That someone earning around $90,000, Mr. President, under the Labor Party would have been paying $21,200 in income tax. But under the Liberal and National parties are paying $18,600, oh, Mr. President, what? a very significant Minister, addition to their take-home pay. Order on my left, Senator O'Neill. Senator Ayres, a second supplementary. Well, I'd ask uh, the minister, when he's answering this question, maybe to be a, bit, a little bit less smug. There's aged care workers up there for whom no provision has been made in the budget for an increase in their wages. Given 52 out of 55 of the government's wage forecasts have been wrong in the past, wrong, and real wages went backwards at a higher rate than even the government's last budget anticipated, why on earth should Australians believe anything that you promise uh, on wages on the eve of an election? Order. Minister. Well, Mr President, Australians should have faith because we've demonstrated an ability to increase the take-home pay of Australians by cutting their income taxes. We've demonstrated the ability to increase the ability of Australians to earn a wage by creating more jobs—1.7 million more jobs under our government, Mr President, that have been created during our time in office—1.7 million more Australians who have the opportunity to work, the opportunity to earn an income, the opportunity to support their families and, thanks to our income tax cuts, get to take more of that pay home as well, Mr President. Now, those opposite I see like to come and they'll grandstand in relation to hard-working aged care workers. I know that, uh, that they will Order. do that, Mr President. I've seen their calls, their calls to say they believe there should be an increase in wages for aged care workers. But will they put a number on that? 
No, Mr President. They don't have the guts. They won't put a number on it. They won't budget a cent for it in their election campaign promises because they're all just hollow Order. rhetoric with no Order. real action. Order. Sen Order. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please outline how the Liberal and National Government's budget delivers delivers an economic plan to secure a stronger economy and create a stronger future for all Australians. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr President. Well, Mr President, I thank Senator Scar for his interest, and I know the interest of every single Liberal and National and Country Liberal Senator in this place who are committed and dedicated to creating opportunities for Australians in a stronger economy. And last night, our government handed down a budget that delivers a plan for a stronger future, that delivers a long-term economic plan to continue the growth in jobs and our economy that is world-leading, that delivers record investments in essential services and necessary and essential investment in our defence and national security. It creates a stronger, more secure Australia. It's a budget that recognises the challenges we've come through from COVID-19 and that we now face in a more uncertain and contested Order. world. It's a budget that recognises the pressures households are feeling right now, which is why we are taking the dividends of a stronger economy to reduce debt, to reduce deficits compared with what had been previously forecast. It's why we're also taking some of those dividends to help ease the pressures on Australian households to ensure that $0.22 cent a litre cut in the petrol excise, which will save around 15 bucks every time an Australian goes to fill up their car and, of course, provides additional benefits to hardworking parents who have to run around to work, to school, to Order. sport, provides additional benefits to those in regional Australia who have further distances to drive and for whom these impacts are greater. It provides additional support to low, middle, fixed-income Australians by lifting the tax offset provisions, by providing one-off payments to help people get through the temporary spikes that we are seeing in relation to cost of living. But of course, it does much more in terms of our plans for the future. It helps first homeowners get more first home buyers into the market. It provides additional support uh, for the provision of housing across the board. Mr President, this is a plan that shows we continue Order. to support Australians Minister. in every aspect of their lives. Minister, your time has expired. Order, Senator Watt. Order. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that outstanding answer. What steps is the government taking to address labour shortages? Labour shortages to ensure Australia's strong economic recovery continues into the future. Minister. Mr President, this is a budget that backs Australians, their enterprise, their aspirations. The past two years have been tough, but our recovery is world leading. It's ahead of the Order. US, it's ahead of the UK, it's ahead of Canada, much of Europe or Japan. Mr President, Labor themselves, I hear lots of interjections, held jobs up as being the big test for the government in terms of how we manage the crisis. That's what Mr Chalmers said and nearly everybody else over there said. And Mr President, Order. we have delivered in spades. Unemployment is headed to a 50-year low. A 50-year low, Mr President, at 4 per cent, headed to 3.75 per cent, creating opportunities to get young Australians into skilled, secure jobs. During the pandemic, we invested some $13 billion in skills and training. The results speak for themselves. A record 220,000 Australians Order. are now in trade apprenticeships the highest number since records Senator began, Thorpe. and last night laid the foundations for even more young Australians Minister, to get an opportunity in an apprenticeship Minister, and in training. Your time has expired. Senator Scar, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Minister for another outstanding answer. I give him another opportunity. Excellent. How will the government's long-term plan for a stronger future help businesses and manufacturers and ensure Australians have the services and the supports they need and deserve? All those Minister. Mr President, small businesses are at the heart of our economy. Nearly 8 million Australians are employed in small businesses. That's why our government delivered lower tax rates for small businesses, the lowest tax rates in 50 years for Australian small businesses. And this, government, this budget builds on that support, 
providing more tax incentives for small businesses to invest in skilling Order, their workforce, Senator more tax incentives for small business to invest in the digital technologies to uplift their productivity and their capabilities. It's a budget also that invests in securing our supply chains as a nation, in manufacturing. We will see the first mRNA vaccine manufacturing facility in the Southern Hemisphere built in Australia. There's additional support for our universities, for CSIRO and industry to ensure the rapid commercialisation of different products innovated in Australia and an extension of our patent box tax Order. reforms Senator to make Pratt. sure that innovations that happen in Australia can be commercialised in Australia and manufactured in Australia, creating more job opportunities for more Minister. Australians into the future. Minister. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Minister, the budget contains $3 billion worth of secret cuts. What are they? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that Senator Gallagher has, uh, has asked that question. I, uh, I thought it was just the foolishness of Mr Chalmers uh, in relation to pursuing uh, this claim of secret cuts somehow. As I've already addressed publicly, uh, Mr President, this budget, uh, this budget. Oh, well, I'm happy, Senator Wong, to repeat it here. That clearly the failings on your side in the ability to read Order. the budget paper, to read the budget Order. taper. There is a reduction, Mr. President. Yeah, Senator Watts holding it up. Go and have a look at his screen. It says a reduction in decisions taken but not yet announced. Guess why, Mr. President? Because we've announced them, Mr. President. Because we've announced them. There's your answer, Order. Senator Gallagher, that in important areas, Order. important areas like women's safety, we had made a provision in my EFO for women's Order safety. We made right. the provision for women's safety. Now we've announced on the spending on women's safety, a very important provision that we put in place in this budget. We did the same, Mr President, in areas of apprenticeship reform. We made a provision in my EFO, and now we've announced the spending on apprenticeship reform. Do you know what this is, Mr President? It's careful, prudent budgeting. It's recognising there may be expenses that come forward in the future, Order. and you put some away to meet those expenses. That, of course, Mr President, is why our government is able to maintain a AAA credit rating. It's why our government is able to hand down budgets where the deficits are lower than expected. Order. Those opposite when in government, those opposite when in government, when they announced budgets, they ordinarily had then deficits far greater than what they had forecast. We have come through a pandemic. We have come through a pandemic, and what we have done in every year since facing that pandemic at budgets, budget updates, and this budget Order, is Senator reduced Wong. the size of the forecast Senator deficits Wong. thanks to our careful Minister, management. Minister, your time has expired. Order. We are not going to go to the question until there's silence. Senator Wong, you're not assisting the chamber. Senator Wong, I have called both sides during this answer. I have called both sides, Senator Wong, in this exchange. I was going to make a comment about how much clearer the chamber was without the barriers, but I'm not so sure anymore. Senator Gallo. Thank you, Mr President. I look forward to pursuing uh, these estimates. Minister, in the MIEFO, you had $16 billion worth of decisions taken but not yet announced. In this budget, in the final forward estimates years, you have $3 billion worth of cuts to expenditure. Why won't you just be up front and explain what those cuts are, or are you just trying to get through to the next election? Minister. That, 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 thanks, Mr President. Well, the thing about the budget is all of the lines of expenditure are there and transparent for the opposition to see. They're Order. there for the opposition to see. Yes, we have, we have taken decisions to reverse out some decisions taken but not yet announced and to realise some of those decisions, to announce them, to publish Senator them in the budget Pratt. papers, to make them transparent. Those opposites seem to think, seem to, those opposites Senator seem, Keneally. Mr President, uh, to think that, of course, government shouldn't put away for potentially foreseen expenditure. We think it's prudent to put away for that. It's a bit like, Mr President, what those opposites used to do on commodity prices. Does anybody remember when Mr Swan 
who of course is the mentor of Mr Chalmers, the now shadow treasurer, when Mr Swan Order. used to take high commodity prices and assumed oh, they'd right. continue into the future. Little oh, wonder his budgets Keneally. blew out. We assume commodity prices will come down. Another act of careful, cautious, conservative Minister, budgeting. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, wasn't last night's budget nothing more than a pre-election cash splash, only to be followed by secret cuts yep. afterwards? Yep. Minister. Order. No, Mr. President, it is not. This budget represents the economic plan for the future Order. for Australia, an economic plan that has delivered record jobs for Australians, an economic plan that has been built on lower taxes for Australians. Under the coalition, income taxes are lower than they were under the Labor Party. Under the coalition, taxes on Australian small businesses Order. are lower than they were under the Labor Party. Under the coalition, taxes on Australian industry and energy and electricity are lower than they were under the Labor Party. Taxes on housing, retirees, investments are lower than they would have been under the Labor Party. Could we imagine Order the disaster that would have right. befallen Australia and during COVID-19 if their $386 billion of higher taxes had been Order. applied just at the time when the economy needed opportunities and room for business to grow? Thank God we won the last election, Mr. President, and we will paint a clear Order. choice to Australians Minister. at the next Minister. election. Senator Wall. I don't think he can hear you, sir. I called the minister when his time expired, Senator Wong. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. How do you justify pouring millions of public money into polluting offshore gas when we're in a climate emergency? I'm not asking you. I'm a, are you the Minister? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm not in— I'm not I... talking to you either. Senator Thorpe, please. It's not entirely clear at the moment which minister this is being directed at. Is it Minister Mackenzie? Whoever. Uh... Okay. Industry, science, and the minister representing the minister for industry. Industry. Senator lower McKenzie. emissions. The minister lower representing emissions. lower emissions have reduced 20 per cent, and we're very proud of that very as a nation. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of countries that talk a big game with respect to lowering emissions, and they actually don't deliver. And on this side of the parliament, we actually focus on delivery and outcomes, uh, not platitudes. We're focused on delivering affordable, reliable energy to support the economy and new jobs. And Australians' competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy and gas will be central Order. to our ongoing economic recovery. On this side, we understand that gas is a critical enabler of our economy, which employs so many working-class Australians. For the past decade, the manufacturing sector Order. has depended on gas as its largest source of energy. Gas makes up 42 per cent of manufacturing's total energy use, according to the latest Australian energy statistics. And that is why our gas-fired recovery is so critical. It is a cornerstone in strengthening Australia's sovereign capabilities. You only need to look at what's happening to gas prices in Europe to see the devastation that can occur to the economy when the prices are rising more than 300 per cent. As a result of industry and government working together, we've been able to avoid these international price hikes, with our prices being around 78 per cent lower than prices in Europe, which were trading at over $47 Australian per gigajoule in mid-March. We're taking action to boost the East Coast gas mask market across the entire supply chain. Through the budget, we're backing Order. seven priority projects, as well as key carbon Senator capture and storage and pipelines with a $50.3 million investment. Our investment will get local gas to where it's needed to help keep the lights on and homes heated in southern Australia. This will, in, in our home state, Senator Thorpe of Victoria, it does get quite cold. Having homes heated during winter is important. Minister, this Minister will... your time has expired. 
Uh, Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. In the interest of human life as we know it, will you introduce a moratorium on offshore gas drilling across this country? Men order. Order on my right. Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President and um, Senator Thorpe. I've just outlined why it is important to back a gas-led uh, recovery post-COVID, not just for local jobs out in the regions and uh, in our industrial sections of our capital cities, so that working Australians can earn a good wage in high-paying, uh, long-term careers, but it is also important that we have a gas-led recovery to ensure that individual Australians and working families can ha heat their homes at an affordable cost. I tried to outline to you, Senator Order. Thorpe, what the impact of not investing in uh, fuel sources such as Senator gas Hughes. can have, and you are seeing the implications of that in Europe right now. And you know what, Senator Thorpe? It is not the people who vote for the Greens that are actually affected by these type of things. It is not uh, the inner city elites on their very high wages uh, that actually Minister, have to worry about Minister, their housing Minister, heating costs. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Thorpe, a second supplementary question. Thank you, President. This government is paying to destroy Gunai Sea country, my country, in Gippsland with the Golden Beach fracking project. Where did you get your consent from to frack my country? Minister. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr President. Well, we are very lucky in this country that both state and federal governments over a long period of time have taken very seriously uh, the need to have the right regulatory framework around uh, the development of particularly uh, gas-fired projects. Order, Minister. On a point of order, Senator Thorpe. Simple question, President. Who gave you consent to frack, Senator Thorpe. stop, Gunai country Senator as a Gunai Thorpe. woman. Who gave you consent? Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, the minister was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have 45 seconds. So, at a both uh, a state and federal level, there are quite uh, strict regulatory controls on both. Uh, on a whole range of approvals that must be sought in terms of building these Order. type of projects. But minister, I absolutely. Minister, Minister, Senator Thorpe on a point of order. I'm a traditional owner of Gunai Country. My mother Senator is on Thorpe. the Elders Council. Senator Thorpe. Where did you get your consent? Senator Thorpe, that is not a point of order. Minister, you have 33 seconds. Order. Senator Thorpe. Senator McMahon, Senator Scar, you're not assisting. Order. Order. Minister, if you wish to make further contribution, you have 30, 27 seconds remaining. Yes, I would, because I proudly Order, back Senator the resources Ford. industry in Australia, including the gas industry, and the tens of thousands of Australians that they employ, hard-working men and women across the length and breadth of Minister, this country. And we do not Minister, take a backward step. Minister, uh, Mr Minister, President, I don't appreciate being Minister, yelled at. Minister, Senator Thorpe, is this a point of order? Absolutely. What is the point of order? The Senator point Thorpe? of order is relevant to my question. And my question is, where did Senator this minister Thorpe. get consent from to, Thorpe. to drill my country? Senator Thorpe, you've had a chance to restate answer your question, question on two occasions. I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. The minister was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have 14 seconds if you wish. Yes, I do, Mr President. Uh, wish to continue. Without the action that our government is taking to address supply, industry and households will be actually faced with higher prices, disruptions in supply and planned outages, and it is low-income Australians expired. that are going to be most affected. The time has expired. The time has expired. Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe, resume your seat. Senator Thorpe, Senator Henderson. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Patterson. 
Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. If I could just ask my question now, please. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Mr. Senator Thorpe. Senator, Thorpe. Senator Davy. Eh. Senator Davy on the point of order. Yep. Senator Sorry, Thorpe. Chair. My point of order is just I would like to carry on with question time. There are other people who have questions, and we, these continual interruptions are not conducive. It's disorderly conduct in the Senate. Senator Thorpe, you had a chance to ask your question. The question was answered by the Minister. Senator Thorpe, we must proceed with question time. Senator Henderson, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister outline how the Liberal and National Government plan outlined in last night's budget would deliver a stronger future for regional Australia? Sorry, uh, I wasn't sure how the question was directed, but I know it was to Minister McKenzie. Please, Minister, you have the call. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Henderson for your question and uh, the way you champion our home state in the regions in Victoria. This is an historic budget for the regions, one that reflects our government and my party's paramount belief that this nation's, this nation's future prosperity is in inextricably linked to the health and wealth and opportunity that exists in our regions. The budget builds on the $100 billion since 2013 that we have already made as a government in infrastructure, digital connectivity, health and education. As the Treasurer stated last night, no government has invested more in our regions than this Liberal National Coalition. And last night, we announced an unprecedented $2 billion regional accelerator program that is open to regional centres across the country that have the ambition and plan to grow, seek to overcome challenges and seize new opportunities that this decade uh, will see. It will take a place-based, locally-driven, data-focused approach enlisting the private sector to drive catalytic, transformative economic growth in areas such as manufacturing, education, supply chains, export opportunities and industry development. From Mount Gambia and Davenport to Mildura or, um, Mildura or Mackay, if these regional centres want to strengthen and grow their local economy and secure a stronger future, this $2 billion program will be available for this purpose. I look forward uh, to prospective councils and regions coming forward with their plans and projects that will create local jobs and build on their own unique local assets. The centrepiece of the Regional Accelerator program, which will be open from 1 July, is the $500 million regionalisation fund, which will deliver opportunities for individual regions to define and invest in their own ambitions for growth. It is intended that the regionalisation fund will provide for larger grants of, say, $10 million or more for transformational projects which will support long-term economic growth and job Minister, creation in the Minister, regions. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can the Minister outline how this budget will grow and strengthen regional communities? Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator. As I was saying, from Mount Gambia to Mildura, from Dubbo to Devonport, new budget initiatives such as our $2 billion regional accelerator program Order. will provide strategic investment to our regions and transform them. Examples on how the regional accelerator program will unlock those, unlock those transformative opportunities is our, a regionally focused two rounds of our modern manufacturing initiative to the tune of half a billion dollars so that those regional centres right across the country that see their ambition as being an industrial heartland and centre will have the support to make that happen. We're putting $200 million towards the regional stream of the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, which will encourage businesses to build resilience across our supply chain, a fragility that was exposed during COVID-19. And we're putting $118 million on the table for regional universities to boost prioritised research and development with industry partners through a regionally focused trailblazers Minister, program. Your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a second supplementary. Uh, can the minister explain the risks to regional jobs, families and businesses if regional Australia is not supported by strong long-term investments? Minister. Order. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. 
This budget sees the largest investment in rural and regional Australia in our nation's history, and it is the Liberal National Government of this generation that's delivered it. Order. Those opposite, the, the leader of the opposition, couldn't even hardly bring his himself to mention the word regions in his national press club address recently. They do not have a plan or the policy initiatives to actually drive economic growth in the regions. Uh, we're seeing a transformation of population shift post-COVID. A lot more Australians are actually recognising that to live in a community where you know your neighbour, you can have a great local job and uh, a prosperous future is out with rural and regional Australians, but it's not going to be those opposite that come to the table with any plan to develop that future. I'm going to be keenly interested uh, in seeing what Mr Albanese delivers tomorrow night and how he focuses on the economic growth opportunities in rural and regional, Minister, but we know Minister, it's only our side of government Minister, that has time, the region's back. Your time has expired. Sorry, Senator Chisholm, just before we go to you, I do wish to draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the gallery of a delegation from Papua New Guinea, led by the Minister for Communication and Information Technology, the Honourable Timothy Masiu. Mas Masiu. Masiu. I hope I've got that right. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. <laughs> Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Eleven days ago, the Queensland government wrote to the Prime Minister asking for assistance with Queensland's flood cleanup and rebuilding effort. But last night's budget announced nothing to help Queensland. Why has the Prime Minister once again turned his back on Queenslanders? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And, um, look, I, I thank Senator Chisholm for, uh, for the question, uh, albeit I think the continued efforts to, uh, to play politics with tragic and terrible natural disasters is, uh, is at the very least unbecoming uh, in, uh, in terms of the way the opposition approach it. Uh, Mr President, firstly, let me place on record uh, all of our thoughts for those affected by recent natural disasters across Australia. Uh, the, loss of, the loss of life, the loss of property, uh, the impacts that that has had upon so many Australians, in uh, particular across parts of New South Wales, South East Queensland, uh, especially most intently uh, in the Northern Rivers parts of New South Wales, uh, but those losses being felt across many regions are real. Uh, they have a devastating impact on families, uh, on businesses and require significant reconstruction efforts. Mr President, in response to those disasters, uh, our government has provided uh, extensive uh, assistance and support to date. Uh, we have provided Mr. President, uh, more than one million uh, payments that have been made uh, to families uh, across New South Wales and Queensland uh, in support uh, of their immediate needs and assistance. Uh, we have provided the initial activation in relation to disaster assistance support across New South Wales and Queensland. And contrary to the question that was asked and the assertion suggesting, Mr. President, uh, that there is, uh, was not Order. coverage in last night's budget, in fact, last night's budget provided more than $6 billion uh, of support uh, for natural disaster assistance response across New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, parts of that response Parts of that response, which I know Senator Watt knows and he's just playing Order. politics with it, is essentially a demand-driven response in elements of Category A and Category B funding, in elements of Category Senator A and Category B funding that we will continue to provide for repair of roads, repair of bridges, repair of infrastructure, a critical support to those communities. Minister. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. And it's not politics to highlight incompetence, which is what we are doing. Order. It has been 20 days since Mr Morrison announced that his government would provide Order. flood victims in the electorate of Page with assistance payments of $3,000 each. Thousands of homes across South East Queensland were also devastated, yet Mr Morrison has only provided Queensland flood victims with assistance payments of $1,000 each. Why does Mr Morrison think flood victims in New South Wales are worth more than three times as much as those in Queensland. Minister. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, this is uh, this is very sad and shallow politicking from uh, from those opposite, who who seem who seem to have decided uh, to turn a blind eye to the facts of the circumstance. 
The facts of the circumstances around a one in 500 year flood event uh, of such magnitude and natural disaster, the likes of which communities have not seen before in relation to what has occurred uh, in those parts of the Northern Rivers districts of New South Wales. Uh, whilst all of these disasters are a terrible tragedy for the communities involved, the intensity, the severity of that flood disaster uh, in New South Wales, as acknowledged, for example, by former Governor-General Peter Cosgrove and others, was the likes of which we have not seen before. So, Order. for those offered to se seemingly begrudge the additional assistance provided to those in the Northern Rivers district uh, is really quite unbecoming, quite Order. unfair, and it is just nothing but cheap politics. Minister. Senator Chisholm, a we can see where the cheap politics is coming from. <laughs> One month on from the floods, Gympie residents are still living in tents and being forced to bathe outside after their houses have been deemed uninhabitable. Why has the Morrison government abandoned flood victims in Gympie? Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. President, it has not. And, uh, and indeed, uh, in Queensland, Order. Mr. President, in Queensland, some 307,045 payments and grants have been, uh, been made. Uh, in Gympie, that is 8,883 uh, to, uh, to date, uh, according to, uh, to the advice uh, that I have. Now, the support does not stop there. The support does not stop there, Senator Watt. Uh, and the way, in which, the way in which you prey on the vulnerable, the way in which you prey on those who have lost, the way in which you seek to achieve political capital Order. at the expense Minister. of people facing Minister. natural disaster Minister. is disgusting. Senator Chisholm on a point of order. On, on relevance, um, this specifically went to those people abandoned in Gympie, of which I have been to and talked to those people. For the minister to treat them that way is absolutely Senate, appalling. Senator They're living Chisholm, in tents. Senator Chisholm, that's not a point of order. Minister, you have 18 seconds remaining. Mr President, we will continue to work under the established disaster guidelines, providing billions of dollars of support into Queensland and to New South Wales in response to these floods, but we won't seek to undertake the type of political grandstanding of those opposite at the expense of the vulnerable. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and National Government's budget is delivering on our commitment to end family, domestic and sexual violence? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Askew for her ongoing interest on in what is a very important issue for every single Australian. Well, in last night's budget, we made uh, an announcement, an historic $1.3 billion of new funding to bring uh, and for new investments to women's safety initiatives. Uh, this brings our commitment to the first action plan uh, under the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children in this country to $2.5 billion. Yeah. The development of the next national plan has been the culmination of many, many months of consultation uh, with advocates, with victim survivors, with service providers, with researchers and other experts across the whole of Australia to make sure that we had the most input uh, and engagement we could. Because we know for the next national plan to succeed, we must listen, we must engage and we must get this right. That's why the plan has been informed, importantly, by contributions by people who have lived experience of family, domestic and sexual violence, which we have managed to gather that information through fora such as uh, the 2021 National Summit uh, on Women's Safety, as well as surveys, targeted consultations, uh, interviews and public comments that we have sought throughout the process. And the voices and experiences of victim survivors are absolutely essential when we design the programs and when we deliver the programs, because we need to ensure that our programs are designed and delivered in a trauma-informed way. Importantly, our investment spans the entire life cycle of domestic violence. We need to deal with prevention, early intervention, response and recovery, because if we are to end gender-based violence, we must address all areas. Uh, the Women's Safety Package included $22.2 uh, million yeah. towards prevention initiatives, including supporting Our Watch. Uh, it included uh, $328.2 million for early intervention, as well as $480 million for response. 
Here. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, in what further ways is the government investing in recovery measures to end violence against women and their children? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Well, listening to victim survivors and people with lived experience um, has actually reaffirmed, uh, reaffirmed what we already know, and that is trauma stays with people unless it's addressed. And we must ensure that people who are suffering trauma get access to the right supports beyond the crisis response. That's over months, years and sometimes lifetimes. Uh, our historic $290 million commitment to recovery measures in yesterday's budget sets out uh, a path to ensure that victim survivors are supported so that they can rebuild their lives, participate in their workforce and participate in their community. We're particularly targeting and committing $48.7 million to provide targeted trauma-informed mental health therapies and helping survivors navigate the health care system. Seeking justice uh, must not add to the trauma, and survivors must be supported to work through their trauma sooner, guided by their own goals, and that is why we're spending 87.9 to expand the Lighthouse Project. Minister. Senator Askew, a second supplementary. Thank you. And how is the government keeping women and children safe when they do make the brave decision to leave a violent relationship? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, our government is absolutely committed to breaking down the barriers uh, to women when they leave a violent relationship. Yesterday, we announced uh, an additional $240 million extension to the escaping violence payment, which provides women up to $5,000 to help them establish a life free from violence. Uh, this will support another 37,000 women who have made that incredibly brave decision to leave a violent relationship. We have also committed an additional $100 million to build emergency accommodation because we know the most important thing on that day that you make that brave decision is to have a safe place to go, a roof over your head where you can start to rebuild your life and get back on your feet. We are also providing $54.6 million to support women and children staying in their own homes when it is safe to do so, through planning, personal safety, uh, etc. And this helps women and children remain in their communities, in their schools without disruption, and ensures perpetrators are punished and not the victim. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cox. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Morrison government handed down a budget that makes housing more expensive, locks in tax cuts for the wealthy and funds more coal and gas projects. Minister, as the climate crisis ravages our country, how can you stand by a budget that provides more than $38 billion in handouts to coal, oil and gas corporations, but cuts climate spending by 35 per cent? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, there was quite a bit in, uh, in terms of that question, uh, but, uh, but I'll try to deal first and foremost specifically with the, uh, the questions that Senator Cox uh, posed at the end of her commentary there. Uh, and Mr. President, it's incorrect uh, to assert, as she did in relation uh, to climate expenditure, uh, the government's investment in relation to achieving net zero, continuing to drive down emissions from the 20 per cent reduction that Australia has achieved uh, to date uh, and continuing to invest in areas of low emissions technology is real. In this budget alone, building on top of our previous low emissions strategies and commitments, in this budget alone there is new funding uh, for microgrids in rural and regional communities to take them uh, off of diesel power generation to give them both cleaner and cheaper electricity for the future. In this budget alone, Mr. President, there is, of course, the uh, patent box reforms I've already referenced to ensure that clean energy, low emissions technologies developed in Australia are actually commercialised in Australia to make sure that we seize the advantage. And all of this is building on the fact in this budget too there's more money for hydrogen, uh, for ensuring that the hydrogen hubs our government is seeking to develop and invest in that industry also supports the development of demand for hydrogen to ensure all aspects of the supply chain for hydrogen are supported, uh, Mr. President. Uh, so this is very strong. Now, in terms of the uh, claims about subsidies uh, that Senator Cox has made, uh, and this is a common refrain from the Australian Greens, where when you dig down, what they're actually talking about are the diesel fuel tax rebates. That's the subsidies they're talking about, which are essentially tax rebates provided uh, to businesses in Australia to those in the resources sector, to Australian farmers as well, tax rebates Order. in relation right. to their business expenses. 
That's not an uncommon thing. It's certainly not a subsidy in terms of their operations. These are some of the biggest taxpayers in Australia, some of the biggest contributors to our economy in terms of jobs and revenue and from that support for climate action, Minister, for example. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Cox, a supplementary question. Thank you. This budget fails to fix the housing crisis. Minister, do you acknowledge that there is $13 billion for property investors in the form of negative gearing and capital gains tax concession, but no new money for affordable housing in this budget? Shame. Order, Minister. Uh, Mr. President, no, I don't acknowledge that, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, because I don't agree with it. Uh, there's, in fact, $2 billion extra in this budget uh, for the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, $2 billion of additional support to help them with the low-cost financing that NIFIC provides through community housing providers to support social and affordable housing. But this is also Order. a budget, Mr President, which we proudly build upon our track record as parties in government of supporting first home ownership. We are proud from the very foundation of the Liberal and National parties to have always supported first home ownership. And the first home guarantee that our government has introduced Order. are Senator helping tens of thousands of young Australians to get Order into their first home right. sooner than would have been the case, Senator to stop Paul. paying rent, to start paying off a house, to have the economic and financial security that comes with owning your own home, and we are incredibly proud of that Minister. achievement. Senator Cox, a second supplementary question. <laughs> if you're a low or middle income earner, this budget gives you a once-off $420 bonus, but under the stage three tax cuts, a millionaire will get an extra $9,000, not once, not twice, but each and every year. Why is the lining of pockets of millionaires more important than helping ordinary Australians with the cost of living? Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, Senator Cox, you mentioned stage three tax cuts. Of course, they're stage three because we've already delivered stage one and stage two. And stage one and stage two <laughs> prioritise low and middle income Australians first and foremost. Now, I know that if we have a change of government, heaven forbid, at the next election, it won't matter whether you're a low-income Australian or a high-income Australian, you'll end up paying higher taxes. You'll end up paying higher taxes, which is evidenced from the fact that every one of Senator Cox's questions Order. was about putting more tax on some of Australia's biggest income earners, more tax in relation to Australian property owners, more tax in relation to Australian workers. What you can see there is the Greens. If they have the ability Order. to hold Senator as they Cox. will the Labor Party, hold them to things in government, then the Australian Greens will be pushing for more taxes on Australian wages, more taxes on Australian housing, more taxes Minister. on Australian industry, Minister. and they will leave Australia Minister. far worse off. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that of the $7.1 billion allocated in the budget to regional areas, none will be spent in South Australia? The minister, order, order, Senator Farrell, Senator Farrell, the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much. And thank you, thank you Senator Smith, uh, for the question in which you seem to have uh, assumed that there's only one measure in the budget papers relating to regional Australia, when in fact there are many measures in the budget papers relating to regional Australia. Yes, Mr President, there is, there is one measure that is particularly focusing on resource and energy hubs and providing investment in terms of infrastructure and spending in those resource and energy oh, hubs. No. But there is also support, Mr President, in other ways for regional Australia. $2 billion of the regional acceleration program that Senator McKenzie was speaking of before, which will help ensure that whether it is across Senator manufacturing or the skills agenda or exporters from regional South Australia, they will have a greater opportunity in relation to accessing those areas of regional funding. In relation to the infrastructure spending, Mr President, 
I've noticed Turn commentary, on. Mr. President. I've noticed commentary in non-South Australian media, in the Financial Review or elsewhere, suggesting that South Australia is receiving a disproportionate share of infrastructure spending. In fact, up to 17 per cent of new infrastructure commitments going into South Australia, Mr. President. So you've got to be careful when you start trying to pick Order, and choose in Senator those Anthony regards, Young. because what we've seen in relation to delivery of the North-South Corridor, in relation to investment in the South East Freeway, in relation to support for the Horrocks Highway, is that in South Australia there is a surge in relation to infrastructure spending and investment supporting Order. SA. And of course, Mr. President, then in terms of our government, of our government, there is perhaps the most significant impact for South Australia, which is what we have done to turn around defence industry investment, Mr. President. Those Order. opposite, those opposite, Mr. President, who commissioned zero vessels when they were in government, zero, zero vessels in terms of naval shipbuilding, versus on this side, 70 vessels as part of a strategy Minister. supporting SA and Minister. WA. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Last month, Liberal MP for Barker, Tony Passan, blasted this government, saying that South Australians in the southeast of the state had felt, and I quote, kicked in the guts and re-traumatised more than two years after they were forgotten in the black summer bushfires. Why does the Morrison government keep turning its back on regional South Australians? Minister. Order. Well, well, Mr. 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 President, Mr. President, I just I do not accept the premise of that question at all. I just went, Mr. President, I just went through a number of the areas of investment for South Australia. And Mr. President, in terms of generating further wealth for regional communities in South Australia, you need look, for example, only at one of our major manufacturing investments that uh, that we have announced and made. The new investment in plant protein will ensure that South Australian grains and legumes producers have the opportunity not just to be exporters of their grains or legumes to the wor world, but to benefit from value adding, to actually have a manufacturing industry that invests in higher value products, generating more for our farmers, more for our regional communities. It's not just that investment in roads, it's not just that investment in other infrastructure, it is of course also that creation of new industries across SA, Order. which are making sure it will be stronger into the future. Senator Smith, a second supplementary question. Senator, as Mr Passon said during the bushfire, South Australians in the South East felt forgotten. They felt kicked in the guts when they missed out on support. Now they've missed out on the $7.1 billion in regional spending. Even when your own Liberal colleagues call out the Morrison government for re-traumatising, forgetting and kicking South Australians in the guts, why should South Australians feel any different? Minister. Well, Mr President, South Australians should have confidence that in relation to what our government has Order. done in supporting SA, in investing in defence, in investing in infrastructure, in supporting regions, has made a fundamental difference in terms of job creation, in terms of economic opportunities. Senator South Australians, Pratt. like all Australians, are paying lower taxes thanks to our government. South Australian businesses, small businesses, are paying lower taxes thanks to Order. our government. South Australians, indeed, like those across the national electricity market, are paying lower electricity prices thanks to our government. Let's just take that for example, Mr President. Uh, that electricity price averages when the Labor Party was last in office grew by 12.9 per cent. But under our government, we've brought that back to 0.4 per cent throughout the life of our government, or indeed a reduction of 8 per cent over the last two years. That means if you're in SA or elsewhere across the NEM, you get the opportunity as a rural Minister, or regional person or anybody Minister, else for more cost-effective living expired. and business. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, as well as a proud Western Australian, Senator Cash. Yeah. Minister, how will this Liberal National Government's plan, as outlined in last night's budget, help Australian small and family businesses who already provide more than four in ten Australian jobs to create more jobs for Australians and secure a stronger economic future for this country? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. 
Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Small for the question. And as always, I acknowledge Senator Small as one of those people who does employ Australians, who runs a small business, Small's Bar, uh, down in Bunbury in Western Australia. And uh, Senator Small. You're on the coalition side of politics, so you understand that small and family business, they are the backbone of the Australian community. They are the heart of our local communities. They employ nearly 8 million Australians. And Mr President, currently in Australia, we have more people in work than ever before. We have more people in work now than we did before COVID-19. And of course, a lot of that has to do with the growth of small business in this country. When you look at how small businesses themselves they embraced the policies that the coalition government put in place throughout COVID-19. Employment in small business has grown by around 10 per cent since the beginning of the pandemic. That just shows you how resilient the small businesses in Australia are, and in particular, uh, Mr President, where Senator Small comes from in Bunbury in Western Australia, how resilient those small businesses are Order. in rural and regional Australia. And last night, what did the government do? Well, we backed small and family businesses ever further. They are already benefiting from the lowest tax rate in 50 years and record investment incentives under the coalition government. That is a stark contrast, Mr President, to what those on the other side offer. Under the other side, they were paying a tax rate of 30 per cent. They are currently paying a tax rate of 25 per cent. That is the lowest tax rate in, tw in 50 years. But last night, we invested further, and in particular, we have invested a tax rebate, a tax deduction, a $120 tax deduction they will get by investing in upskilling their workforce. For every $100 a small business spends on training their Minister, employees, they will Minister, get a $120 Minister, tax your deduction time back. Has expired. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Minister Cash, in light of that outlining of achievements for small and family businesses in Australia, doing what they do best, creating jobs, employing Australians and training Australians for future jobs. How is this a budget delivered by the Liberal national government that can ensure Australia's small and family businesses continue to do what they do best, unimpeded by red tape, with easier access to support from this government that understands their needs. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, again, Senator Small, he understands small business. So he understands that in particular, investing in his workforce, in the skilled workforce, that ensures that small businesses are able to prosper, to grow, and to create more jobs for Australians. Senator Small, also understands, though, how important it is for the government to invest in small businesses so that they can embrace the digital revolution. And, Mr. President, you saw it again last night. The coalition government further investing in the capacity and the growth of small business. From budget night, every hundred dollars these small businesses spend on digital technologies like cloud computing. We know how important that is e-invoicing, cybersecurity and web design, that will now see them get a $120 tax deduction. That again is getting them into where we need them to be, the digital age. But also, Mr President, what we are focused on is cutting as much red tape as we can for small business, because Minister, when you cut red tape, Minister, they prosper, they Minister, grow, they create more Minister. jobs for Australians. Senator Small, a second supplementary. Th thank you, Mr. President. And uh, we've heard a lot from Minister Cash on, uh, I guess, the strengths of Australia's small and family businesses in providing those jobs and taking up the support that they get from this government to support the investment that underpins the jobs. But the real question that faces this chamber and indeed the people of Australia very shortly is: What are the risks to those uh, jobs and economic opportunities? if our small and family businesses in this country are not supported by a government that wants to see them prosper and grow? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr President. I think it's pretty obvious uh, on this side of the chamber what the greatest uh, risk to small and family businesses is, and that is, of course, an Albanese Labor government. Why? Because the closest most of them have ever come to a small business is to proudly close it down. That is unacceptable behaviour, Mr President, unacceptable behaviour. And when it comes to 
taxes. There's only one way that those on the other side go, Mr. President, and that is up. It is in their DNA. With us on this side, we know that for small businesses, the best thing you can do for them is to lower their taxes. Order and that is why, under right. the coalition government, Order. they are paying the lowest tax rate, the lowest Order. tax rate, Mr President, in 50 years. And then you look at the alternative Order. Prime Minister. You Order. look at the alternative right. Prime Minister. Minister. <laughs> Sorry, before I come to you, Senator Patrick, I will ask those on my right that was getting excessive in terms of the noise. Senator Patrick? I was just going to uh, raise a point of order. I couldn't hear any of the minister's answer. Uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was struggling myself, Senator Patrick, and that's something to say when it's Senator Cash on her feet. Senator Cash, you have 16 seconds. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, when it comes to lowering taxes, that is in the DNA of the coalition government. The DNA of the coalition government. We lower taxes, you raise taxes. We look at small business and we say you deserve more of what you earn and we will give it back. You, on the other hand. Sorry, we did have a little error with the timing there. So, well, no. Sad, sadly, Minister Cash, your time had actually. Your, your time had actually expired. Senator Kennedy, were you on that issue? I was actually seeking the call for the next question. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs and Defence Personnel, Senator Payne. Yesterday, Minister Gee, Mr. Minister G, excuse me, told the House that there was $96 million in the budget to clear up a backlog of veterans' compensation claims. Uh -oh. Can this minister tell the House in which budget paper and on what page that $96 million can be found? Oh, no. oh. Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I uh, thank Senator Keneally for her question. I don't have that budget paper with me. Senator Order. Senator Keneally, but I will note that this government has, and I will take that on notice, therefore, uh, but I will note that this government invests over $11.5 billion each year to support veterans and their families—336,000 veterans and their family. Mr President, I am seeking Order. to respond to what I regarded as, perhaps mistakenly, a serious question from those opposite. If it is not possible to respond to that question by Order. indicating that I will take it on notice and I will return to the chamber and to provide Senator Keneally with further information, then I will decline to answer the question any further. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. On the weekend, Minister G threatened to resign if he did not receive the $96 million in the budget. He labelled the 60,000 60, unprocessed claims within his department a national disgrace. Why does it take a minister speaking up publicly and threatening to quit for Mr Morrison to take responsibility? And where is this $96 million? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Order. President. And I absolutely reject the, uh, the propositions put Order. by Senator Keneally uh, in her question. As a government, we've invested over half a billion dollars to implement substantial changes to the Department of Veterans Affairs processes uh, and their technology, making it both easier and faster for veterans and their families to access both services and support. We've seen the number of claims received by DVA uh, double, in fact, more than double, over the last three financial year. Order. Uh, and that, of course, requires additional resourcing to manage, and that's exactly what the Australian government uh, is doing. This budget has provided an initial $22.8 million, which will fund 90 extra staff to address that backlog of unprocessed claims. And it will be followed by a further investment uh, to continue to improve the veteran claims processing system and to reduce waiting time. Mr President, as a nation, we have looked very closely at the support we provide to veterans and their families in this country. I want to acknowledge Order. each and every one of them for their service and their families Minister, for supporting them Minister, as well. Your time has expired. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Thank you. When asked why it took Minister G threatening to resign for his government to provide the necessary funding, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, I wouldn't agree with that assessment. Given the $96 million required to get through the 60,000 unprocessed claims appears nowhere in these budget papers, 
isn't it just the latest example of Mr Morrison not telling the truth right. to the Australian people and to his own colleagues? Right. Order, Minister. President, and unsurprisingly, Senator Keneally is absolutely fundamentally Order. wrong. But I'm from New South Wales, so I'm used to that. And the people of the electorate she's going to purport to represent at the next election are going to have to get used to that too, Mr Order. President. But to be absolutely Order. clear and in the absence of Order. any facts from the Order. other side, Mr President, Order. let me— Minister. Minister. Please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. On a point of order, Mr President, there is no universe in which that contribution was directly relevant to the question. And I'd ask you— Order no, it's in a the bit. chamber. <laughs> so I'd ask you to remind the minister of the question. S Senator Wong, minister, I will— On the point of order. I began by saying in my response to Senator Keneally's supplementary question that she was absolutely and fundamentally wrong. That is completely pertinent to the question. So order, order, order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, I've allowed you to bring the minister back to the question. Minister, you have 45 seconds remaining if you wish to add anything further. Thank you very much, Mr. Qu Mr. President. And I do wish to indicate that in addition to the funding I've already discussed and the funding provided in the 21-22 budget of over $137 million, there is also a total increase of 447 APS positions across the DVA, taking the staff to over 2,000 uh, Australian public service staff. The additional funding and the average staffing level received through this budget will be used to recruit additional APS staff, both ongoing and non-ongoing, across DVA. In the claims processing area, this will take into account that absolute requirement to reduce the backlog about which Minister G has been so committed over two years and ensure appropriate staff are available to maintain claims processing at a normal rate into the future, yes, as sir. is required. Your time has expired. Minister Birmingham. Mr. President, Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, Mr. President, I also seek leave, as uh, foreshadowed at the commencement of question time, to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting and the routine of business for today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Mr. President, I move the motion as uh, as circulated and as indicated in my earlier contributions. Uh, indicate that the motion does uh, contain provisions for the consideration of the disallowance motion at the request of the Australian Greens, and I also understand also for the consideration of uh, an aged care bill um, at uh, the request of Senator Patrick. So the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it.